Hello, everybody. A uh, warm welcome to the eighth webinar of KIX EAP. EAP stands for Europe, Asia, and Pacific, but actually it also included, includes pockets of the Middle East, such as Yemen and Sudan, in total 21 countries that this KIX hub is serving. KIX stands for Knowledge and Information Exchange. It's a multi-year project funded by the Global Partnership for Education through the IDRC, International Development Research Center in Ottawa. We are very happy as NORAC to host this hub because we really believe in the mission of the hub, which is giving voice and amplifying expertise in the Global South. We know we have a lot of uh, global public goods, databases, studies, scoping studies, but we think, and that's the KICS mandate, that more national expertise input is needed. So we are very happy to support this mission. And this today's webinar in particular is co-hosted by NORAD because the topic will be uh, dealt with in the next NSI issue, NORAC Special Issues Journal in fall. It will come out in multiple languages. Um, and the topic is on COVID and education in a state of emergency. We were extremely pleased that we managed to enlist and, <laughs> and bring on board the best scholars in this field, in the oldest, one of the oldest, the other oldest is Teachers College, Columbia University, one of the oldest programs in comparative and international education. UCL, University College London, Institute of Education is the oldest graduate program in comparative and international education. And as such has a huge expertise, a large faculty, a large student body, working for many years in the field of education and development. Two of the very known scholars at that institute, Professor Elaine Unterhalter and Marie Lal are here together with postdocs and doctoral students, but also policymakers and practitioners that contribute to that special issue. So again, let me extend my welcome. This is from KIX EAP. And our partners are Acer, FHI 360, Nazarbayev University, UNICEF Regional Office in Geneva, but also in Paris, IIP, and UNESCO Bangkok. So we are a whole consortium of like-minded institutions who believe in strengthening global expertise from the South. Having said that, let me pass the floor to Jose Luis Canelias. He is the manager for the KICS EAP Hub. Jose Luis. Thank you, Professor Gitusana Ramsey, and hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today here. Um, I'll give a short introduction on the order of play of our webinar today. So we will start by Professor Elena Anterhalter, who is Professor of Education and International Development and co-director of the Center for Education and International Development, CID at UCL Institute of Education. Professor Elena Anterhalter, she will be uh, giving us uh, a presentation on revisioning disruptions and states of emergency, education and research in the time of COVID. We will then move to a moment of questions and discussions where we ask all participants to, during the presentation, anytime during the webinar, to include your questions in the chat. And then uh, our moderator will be reading the questions from the chat and also be inviting some of you to pose your questions orally. From this first moment of questions and discussions, we'll have Dr. Kusha Anan, who is a research fellow at UCL Institute of Education and Prof. She's a professor of education and South Asian studies at the UCL Institute of Education. They will be talking to us about teachers digital agency and pedagogy during the COVID crisis, COVID-19 crisis in India. We'll have a second moment of questions and discussions before moving to the final presentation from Pravin Balakrashan, secondary school teacher, teacher in Malaysia and also contributor to NORAC Special Issue 6. 
and Praveen will be uh, sharing with us his, his research on the pandemic shock on an education system uh, through an actor, actor network theory perspective. We'll have then a final Q&A session and then we'll close our webinar. So with no further ado, I'll, I'll give the floor to Professor Elaine Interhalter. Thanks very much, Jose Luis, and thanks to NORAC for organizing this, the NORAC and KICKS. And um, it's a great pleasure to participate in a webinar with people from all over the world and the vast array of expertise. Jose Luis, do you think you could uh, yes, show the, the slides? Um, I will start. Uh, yes. And um, uh, which will guide my speaking on, on, mm -hmm. on, on this topic. Um, the title for, for the presentation um, has got a lot of large, largely framed ideas. And um, these ideas, revisioning, disruption, and states of emergency are, are full of ambiguity. And I, I think it's that theme of ambiguity that I want to circle around in this discussion beca uh, because um, it's been a feature of education and leaning in and education research, which is leaning in so many different directions in this uh, time of COVID-19. So um, uh, the key idea is about ambiguity, but um, both its possibilities and um, difficulties. I'm, I'm, I'm stepping off from the thinking that's gone into the NORAC special issue that um, Gita mentioned that Will Brem, Moses Oketch and I are co-editing. Um, and uh, the special issue is organized, uh, which has the title States of Emergency, and that is itself um, uh, you know, got this ambiguity in its kernel. What are the states? What are the emergency? Where the, the special issues or organized around six large themes, inequality, states, technology, nature, time, and affect. And in each uh, section of the special issue, there's been a specially commissioned paper, which has, um, unpacked a perspective on those themes. And then the submitted articles um, engage both with their own research and perspective and some of the ideas formulated um, by the uh, invited writers. So it, it's, it's a, a layering of, of, of perspectives and um, insights. And what I'm going to do in the presentation um, is, is try to give my interpretation from our preliminary reading and a discussion with um, the, the, the articles we're selecting. Jose Luis, if we could go to the next slide, I'll um, talk a bit about some of the emerging themes. Um, on education, what is clear is that emerging themes are about uncertainty and instability. And um, these uh, four um, uh, uh, threads that um, I want to talk through are not the only features of education that emerge from the that have struck me as particularly resonant. The first is the repositioning of education. I think we're in the education sector, we've uh, always been aware that education is a kind of handmade um, discipline. It supports the economy, it supports political projects, it supports cultural or religious projects. And while we are very interested on its internal processes, we're also very aware of its external facing interfaces. I think one of the things that the pandemic has done and what it has, um, what, what articles for the special issue highlight is this repositioning of education, both actually physically 
in that um, education, schools were closed and education was taking place in different places, in homes, in, commu in community settings, in places that were different. But I think the other thing that the pandemic has highlighted is that education can as much be a site of vulnerability and a place that requires us to attend to care and social protection as it is about learning, as it is about connecting with innovation and dynamism. So that repositioning and re tuning education, I, I think, is, um, is a key theme and is requires rethinking, it requires repositioning of education researchers. And I'll come to that point in a minute when I talk about what the pandemic has done to education research. A theme much commented on is the inequality but the form that that inequality takes and the disruptions um, that have been experienced um, are, are very, very different. And the, one of the features I wanted to um, highlight and that comes across from the articles is that the disruption is about time being dislocated. So the pandemic is experienced differently whether schools and educational experience are um, circumscribed in months. Um, some people have lost months of schooling, just a term. Some people have lost entire years. And many people are now talking about the COVID decade, that the effects of the pandemic and the disrupt, disruption and dislocated times need to be um, factored in as a decade and with major disruption for the SDG program, which I know is, is also on the minds of many people who are probably on the call. Um, this um, revisioning of education that the um, pandemic has brought into um, focus suggests a revisioning of how we think about inequality because inequality is always in education i think being talked about in what i call descriptive inequalities just inequalities of how much how much education do certain groups girls or boys rich or poor dominant or subordinate groups get but what i think the pandemic has called into being is the need to rethink what equality in education means and what will support it. So what kind of revisions to all the modalities of education, the curriculum, the teaching and learning, the administration, the management, the assessment, the evaluation, what kinds of revisions are needed to support our revisioning of equality? And I think that Lastly, uh, the last big theme um, where there's uncertainty and um, I probably have to put, a, should have put a question mark on the end of the slide is um, what kinds of realignments are emerging? Um, we're very uh, well aware of the global, um, global north, global south realignment. We're aware of the um, realignments between policy and practice between ideal uh, ideal visions about rights and the imperfect uh, um, delivery of them but i think what we see in the pandemic is new kinds of connections being made between people and it's that i think that education research reveals in a very um uh uh, live kind of way. So if we go to the next slide, Jose Luis, um, I just wanted to talk about some emerging themes about education research that have come from the um, article submitted for the special issue and my thoughts on them. Uh, 
quite clearly uh, and very distressingly, some large education programs have been halted, curtailed, lost their funds, or have to rethink what they do. So there's been, a, and for many months, many education programs have been paused and have uh, education research programs have not been able to be conducted. So there's been a sense in which education research has been demobilized. But what's very striking from the special issue is that there's been a kind of growth of um, uh, inventiveness bubbling up from below. There's what I call this decentering. So the authority of the education researchers located in um, with large programs, large pockets of money, large um, uh, work plans to fulfill. A lot of that was paused and into that silence came many, many activities of many different groups of researchers doing things differently. And uh, the two papers we're going to hear today are very, uh, by Marie and Krusha and by Praveen, are really exemplars of this uh, decentering and bubbling up from the bottom. Another feature of education research in the time of COVID has been this uh, process that I call real-time research. You have um, uh, big centers like uh, the, uh, the epicenter at UCL um, developing living maps. I and mean, apparently 400,000 pieces of research have been published on education and COVID in the last um, year. So that the amount of work and study is just extraordinary. Uh, but so you get, what you're getting is living maps that are distilling these research studies and people are able to see research coming out in real time. So that long time between uh, conducting a study uh, and disseminating it has been contracted. You're, you, you have living dashboards are being updated daily or weekly on the nature of, uh, of uh, children, numbers of children out of school, forms of government um, uh, response, and you're getting rapid reviews being done of the research as people try and synthesize. So this no notion of real-time research assisting real policy making, I think is a new feature, a welcome feature. It will need some thought about whether speed, we are sacrificing um, thoughtfulness for speed, but it's definitely needed leading to new alignments. I think the third point I wanted to highlight is how there's been a real challenge to academic hierarchies. The inequalities around um, uh, who controls the major theories, who controls the major, who are the gatekeepers to the major publication uh, channels. Um, are, are really being channeled as new forms of communication come out using um, podcasts, uh, using blogs, using Twitter, using um, all kinds of more informal and more democratizing potentially forms of knowledge. We know that those areas can be problematic because um, maybe some of the niceties of peer review are not observed in all settings and care needs to be taken. And there's also a question of whether new perspectives can be sustained and um, uh, supported through um, beyond the pandemic. Um, Two, two words, so so I think all, for me, it feels research are all positive. It's all about breaking uh, old, um, old molds and, and listening to new views and being alert to them. But two words of caution. Um, the first is that I think the policy discourses are very much subject to expressing the same kind of confusion that I think is part of the education scene. Um, 
And I, um, I've written about this um, form of confusion of saying one thing and doing another as a feature of education policy discourse under neoliberalism. And I refer to this uh, framework as dispersal. The, this idea about dispersal comes from Foucault's idea in the archaeology of knowledge, where he talks about discourse as a system of dispersal. And what we're seeing, uh, and I've written about this in relation to gender and girls education, where you can say one thing about girls' rights, or, uh, uh, but do something completely different in your education research that undermines what you're doing. And I think some of this confusion between um, democracy and authoritarianism, between education, contraction linked to technologies and expansions linked to inventiveness and community connection. All of that is a feature of the policy discourse and we need to be alert to it. And the last point is that we might appear to be talking together, but in fact, we need to be very alert to how different issues um, how we might be meaning different things. So this paper that I'm writing about, what, um, what do we talk about when we talk about children, education and poverty, is an attempt to draw out the different resonances. We think we're saying the same thing, but there are many different layers. So that issue that education research needs to be alert to and able to reveal um, these different layers and um, contested meanings. Um, we have many methods to do that, but I think it's, it's never been so important because of the um, uh, huge disruption of the, the pandemic that we deploy those skills. So the two papers that we're going to hear, which are, if we just go to the next slide, are really um, generative examples of the work I've, uh, of the themes I've uh, highlighted. They, they look at, uh, they both uh, as examples of education research are inventive and uh, have taken the crisis of the pandemic to do something and to illuminate the crisis with really interesting work from India and Malaysia. And they both, um, of, while being alert to the difficulties of conducting education research in the special time, they suggest new kinds of collaboration and through that process, new kinds of insight into education and uh, this terrible crisis we find ourselves in, but also point to ways to revise what we do and revision what we wish to do. So let me hand to um, uh, to, uh, to you for the Q&A now. And Marina, I think, is going to give me some of your questions to respond to. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Elaine. So I'd like to invite everyone to pose uh, some questions in the chat. Uh, please feel free to, to type in those there. Uh, we just received a question from um, David Cross, HeartScam UK, who's asking, we talk of education being relocated from schools to homes, but do we need to distinguish education from schooling? Many families in the UK have experienced stress because they feel obliged to try to replicate what they perceive to be schooling around their kitchen tables. They seem to lack the confidence to focus on educating their children. Would you like to comment on that? It, it, it's it's such it, it's such an interesting question, and it's definitely one of the threads in uh, the um, what I'm thinking about on this. What do we talk about when we talk about uh, children, education, and poverty? Because the um, um, the mutability or the kind of um, notion that education takes place in schools and outside schools is um, what's um, I think smuggled in many of the excluding factors uh, associated with education and children with poverty as well as um, 
the inclusive processes so that um, the expansiveness of the notion of education and the way in which we've tended to think about school as only that sort of formal hierarchy of um, formal instruction and formal progression. I think those both of those categories are in tension. And I mean, what I would hope is that the uh, richer, liberal, more transformative notion about education get, gets more space in relation to schooling, but the, the kind of dislocations that you're um, alerting us to, David, that um, the uh, families think that schooling has to be formal instruction, formal gobbets of, of, um, uh, of, of, of syllabus, um, all of that, you're not going to undo that in, in a small amount of time. And so that's also why I think this alertness to how do we understand the pandemic and may, you know, often the talk of the COVID decade is a talk of despair um, that the effects of the, of, um, well, despair reality that the effects of the pandemic will go on for 10 years that it might also give us 10 years of trying to engage more richly with what education is. I know I'm talking around your question rather than answering it, but I think it, um, uh, it's, a di it's a dialogue to which the, you know, I, I can't get to a point, but I want to open the space. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Professor. Um, so I would like now to invite uh, Sushi Shetza from Nepal to share, uh, to pose her question orally. Sushi, can you hear? Yeah. Uh, namaste. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your wonderful uh, presentation. I am Sushi Shetza from Nepal. My uh, query to you is, uh, in this current pandemic, uh, Nepal is facing lots of problems, especially to adapt the full online teaching learning uh, courses. So uh, I just want you to, to share your some opinion or tips on how we should move forward in coming days to run uh, the classes smoothly, um, because in Nepal, uh, due to lack of infrastructure and awareness, uh, even the teachers and the students are facing problems. So can you suggest us some ideas on how we should move forward? Thank you. It's, that's really hard. And uh, it's really hard to hear of all the intense problems. And I know the article submitted to the special issue highlight this issue about uh, uh, much of the commentary, the highlight, the issue about inequalities in access to technologies. Um, richer children have broadband, have time of data, have have access to data uh, and money to spend on that. They have good computers. They have um, uh, uh, teachers who have adapted lessons. And uh, the, the dislocation of learning in that for poorer children, if you're using other technologies, radios or phones or um, bits of, uh, of learning delivered by other remote technologies. It's often out of sequence. It's often um, uh, not in the right language. It's um, all the disruptions and difficulties and um, uh, connections around home, home um, where you live disrupt all of that, all of this. My only suggestion is that, the, the, and the, this comes just from reading is examples um, of what people say, is, is consultation. But uh, often in local communities, people have got very good ideas, whether they, um, there's a community radio uh, and uh, 
people can then organize uh, a program of learning around that in, in local sites. Um, and uh, there, there's one contribution to the special issue, very um, uh, uh, graphic about children who had to climb up and down mountains to get the signal for their phone and then mothers clubbing to go to the market to buy the data. Um, so I can't give you a national solution. I, I think I have to say that the solutions are going to have to be local and they'll have to be consulted with, but that the importance of attending to the inequalities of people's access and uh, the diversity of needs always needs to be in the center of concern. I, I hope that helps you, Sushil. Um, thank you. Thank you, Professor Lane. Uh, and this, uh, your response really resonates with some uh, questions and comments we've been receiving in the chat as well. We received a, a question from Doshu from Bhutan uh, asking how to address the lack of ICT infrastructure uh, that many countries face as well. And also uh, we received comments uh, talking about important role of um, parents um, and families in this response, and also on the challenges of uh, quality uh, education during the pandemic. But uh, maybe we can address a last question um, that just came in from uh, Joe QC Lebanon, uh, who asks, hello everyone, I would like to know whether and how you think existing research on education in crisis affected context can usually can usefully inform our understanding of the impacts of the pandemic. Although much of this existing research has focused on armed conflict, it does center those inequalities that occur in and through education and examines their internal and external implications. Do you see crossover lessons between existing EIE research and pandemic related research? Thanks, Marina, and um, I, uh, thanks for the question. I, I, I think this is a very, very fruitful area, and I, I myself have been um, very um, uh, it, uh, drawn or, or gained a lot from thinking about the, uh, the research on uh, education in conflict and crisis. I, uh, I think the, the the point that I was probably making too um, baggily about time is is the key point uh, I, uh, for, uh, that uh, comes to us from the education in crisis and conflict, because what that research highlights is that what we must be concerned with is education disruptions. I'm very um, uh, critical of, 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 uh, of a discourse that talks about learning loss as though the, because children haven't had X number of lessons that learning is lost and income will be lost. And uh, you know, as, as, as though uh, learning is water that goes into the ground and you know, sorry, I'll stop that metaphor. <laughs> it's going in the wrong way. Um, but the, the, what the crisis and conflict research shows us is that learning is disrupted and also that even under conditions of extreme crisis and conflict particular processes of of listening of engagement of flexibility and of um, concern with equalities can hold things stable for a while, even when things are utterly unstable. So I, I think putting that, um, uh, the, those example, the, those concerns with um, uh, peace, peace and living through disruption are, are very important concerns for planners, for researchers, for teachers and um, for commentators on, on, on this period. Um, thanks, Marina. Thanks, Professor Lane and the Halter for the great reflections. 
Uh, now I'd like to give the floor uh, to Dr. Kusha Anand and Professor Mahri Law, who will talk to us about teachers, digital agency, and pedagogy during the COVID-19 crisis in India. I'll just wait for the slides to come up. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Kusha. Um, I'll just go to the next slide. Right, I'll start. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, uh, for to Gita and to Jose Luis and Marina and the wider uh, Kicks Network. I thought that's a very cool name uh, for inviting us to this absolutely fascinating webinar. And thank you, Elaine, for setting the scene because um, actually I'm going to pick up on a few of your things which I wasn't planning to talk about, but I'll pick up on some of the things you brought in. But I want you to have a quick look at this picture. Um, everyone, because uh, this is what a normal classroom used to look like in India. And so uh, a year ago, Kusha and I were going to start on a, what was an absolutely massive project of field work in Delhi and across three other Indian states, looking at classroom practices in government schools. Very specifically, we were interested in what works and why and teacher voices, and it was uh, we took eight months to put the team together and plan it and uh, we were going to sit in classrooms and do weeks and weeks and weeks of observation across these four locations um, and in uh, Kusha was already in India she uh, went there in March and I was due to follow after my last lecture a sort of early April second or third of April I was booked to fly and then a year ago India locked down closed its borders I have been sitting in this room for this entire year, which is quite unusual because normally I spend five months of my uh, five months a year on average in the field. Go to the next slide, please. And um, so basically we were stuck. She was stuck in her parents' house in Delhi. I was stuck here in this room. Um, and uh, the team was individually stuck in their various homes. Some people working from their kitchen table with their children playing next door. And we uh, all had this meeting and looked at each other. It has just changed absolutely everything. In the first instance, it's changed. It had to change the research focus. We had to rethink everything. You can't go and look at classroom practice when there's actually nothing going on in the classroom, when the schools are empty. Um, and during this lockdown, no one was even allowed to venture onto the street unless they had a special pass. Uh, so that was the first shock. And then we also had to say that if we can't access schools, we're going to have to change our entire methodology and have to move online. And I, I've always been very skeptical about doing work online. So this was a very, very steep learning curve for me. And we also had to engage with the fact that the participants who we were going to engage with, the teachers, had um, were going to change that or had to change their practice. They were moving from classroom practice to online practice. So starting with this thinking about the change of teacher practice, we had a few conversations with teachers um, and decided that in the first instance, and at the first part of the project, we were going to look at how they felt about the changes, how they adapted. Um, and so we started with those questions and then adapted our methodology rather than going into schools. And we designed I'm not a big fan of surveys and I have to say that the second part of the project that we did was all done with zoom interviews, but at the time in end of April early May, no one was comfortable with doing interviews online. So we started with an online survey piloted it and then administered it to 550 teachers and we got 288 responses and the wider results of the survey are published in an open access article. But this particular aspect that we're talking about today, we have kept just for the NORAG article, which engages with the issue of digital agency of teachers and how that changed in this new online space, how they were affected. So reflecting very much what Elaine said earlier on in terms of how they had to adapt, how they had to come up with local solutions given on, given on their own context. And one particular aspect is going to talk is our uh, even when governments were trying to provide things for them, actually those things didn't necessarily work locally. So local um, solutions had to be found by teachers on how to help their students. So Kusha is going to take us through um, the three or four aspects that we identified as part of the new digital agency. And then I'll come back to give you some concluding thoughts. 
where I'll also pick up on the Nepal question and on what's happened in Pakistan and what's happened in Myanmar. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lal. Hello, everyone. India, as in many other countries in early 2020, it was simply assumed that teachers would be able to transfer their pedagogy online. However, for them to be successful in this new dimension of the job, teachers need to have a digital agency. And digital agency, uh, to what I mean, is a blueprint for ensuring that people can engage with technology in a meaningful and capital enhancing way, as opposed to mainly functioning with technology. As you can see in this figure, digital agency also includes competence, confidence, and accountability. And it's actually the individual's ability to control and adapt to a digital world. In the following slides using FASI's framework, I will present the pedagogical issues around these three strands and speak about how teachers' engagement in online teaching has affected their digital agency. I will summarize by presenting some innovative pedagogical responses. To so start with digital accountability is actually the responsibility for oneself and others responding to one's digital actions, knowledge of the digital world and its ethical issues. Being in lockdown and working from home, spatial relations between teachers and students and families change. Online classes will have given parents and school management undue advantage to monitor teachers' classroom practices. As you can see on this slide in the first quote, a teacher shared that her digital classroom is actually is in, is in a prayer room where her mother-in-law is look, staring at her and actually waiting for her to finish the teaching so that she can start her prayers. In the second quote, teachers shared that their family members sometimes watch them teach, record videos, or access students' records. Overall, under the home environment setting, teachers reported that the family does not understand the gravity of the online assessments or teaching. Even the privacy and the propriety related issues establish a major concern among these teachers. Due to spatial issues, teachers express low levels of personal capacity, acting with low digital or accountability towards themselves and their students. Moving on, digital competence is our ability to safely and effectively navigate the digital world or resources such as hardware or software. As Professor Lal mentioned in Delhi, there are several sets of digital resources offered by the National Council of Educational Research and Training, NCRT, and the CBSC, the Central Board of Secondary Education Research. It includes videos, tools, textbooks, applications, and so on. Even then, a majority of teachers share that they're teaching online without proper training and therefore are facing problems in using these digital tools and the resources offered by the government for teaching. So teachers use tools that they're familiar with and a few teachers share that they use WhatsApp to divide their students into two groups, the ones owning smartphones and those with cell phones. And they use WhatsApp groups and text messages or SMS to reach out to both groups respectively. In these two quotes, teachers share their experience of using WhatsApp for teaching and how in, in case if the students do not have access to phones, teachers call parents and distribute worksheets or homework for a week. In terms of uh, students' engagement, teachers shared that teaching through digital resources or tools had been reduced to one-way delivery with little or no personal contact, no way of checking who's getting it and who's not. Teachers also perceived involving students and their parents with digital technology as an additional challenge. So a digital teacher, digital competence, plays an important role, it's not just in handling the digital resources, but also using them confidently in the enactment of the curriculum to meet the diverse needs of students, which I will present in the next slide. Now coming on to the digital skills, which are core building block. Mainly referred to here as taking control of social changes arising from the use of digital technology. A majority of teachers reported teaching using online resources as ineffective, exhausting, and a demotivating experience. 
Some teachers also reported that online teaching requires more effort, autonomy, and skills, but that hardship is hardly recognized by head teachers. As you can see from these two slides, on, to, to these two quotes on the slide, a few teachers were not comfortable and confident to teach some subjects online, which involves numerical experiments or personal interaction. For example, language teachers explained that in face-to-face -face teaching, language difficulties are mitigated because they use bilingual method to address students' doubts and queries. But while teaching in a real classroom, the physical environment of sight and sound becomes an effective medium for teachers to express himself or herself confidently and to also gauge the level of students' understanding, while the virtual medium lacks this direct contact between teacher and student. Whether it's a play or a poem, the expression of the teacher and voice modulation matters because it adds meaning to the written content. Also, maths and science teachers express the low level of confidence to teach without chalk or experiment in a lab. Teachers shared that the instant assessment of students' understanding becomes difficult, although there are online tools that can be used after the concept or topic is taught rather than simultaneously. But the respondents mentioned that the virtual mode can never compensate for the physical mode of interaction involved in a classroom teaching. As a result, teachers shift their emphasis on tricks, jugar, or important questions to remember for success in an examination, then conceptual understanding or critical thinking. Teachers also made some adjustments and devised new teaching strategies during the lockdown. Among the most common changes adopted by the teachers is the use of multimedia content, reduction of pen and paper during classes, changes in what and how homework is assigned. A few teachers also shared that the, on, the activity-based online learning and digital homework are also common teaching strategies used during the pandemic. A science teacher shared that teaching new scientific concepts without a lab was a task until she started finding alternative methods of explaining the same through easily available contents in her kitchen at home. But this was not the case for all teachers. A few teachers reported that they are unable to teach effectively in the lockdown due to non-academic duties. A majority of our respondents shared that they're spending a lot of time in distributing rations of food packets during the lockdown, surveying in colonies, and sometimes working in containment zone and quarantine centers in common schools in Delhi. Even though the lockdown has taken away a lot emotionally and physically, these teachers are doing their best to keep up the spirit of students by using these teaching practices. With this, I would like to hand over to Professor for her concluding remarks. Thank you, Kusha. That was really some nice examples which people can sort of take away, both sort of showing that things that were difficult, but also solutions, local solutions, which sort of reflects what Elaine was saying earlier on. So um, the voices that we presented is, I'll show you that the teachers really faced stark difficulties, mainly in training up, getting used to the digital space, adapting things, making things work locally. And um, this is uh, quite a difficult thing for teachers to do because they very often have their own children at home and they have to manage the dual thing of managing their children as well as managing the children that they're teaching. The other thing is it also excludes teachers who never manage to make that jump into the digital world. And in fact, from, from our perspective, we will never know how they experienced anything because we had to do this research online and anyone who was not part of the digital world would not have been able to access this survey and we would not have never have known about their experience. But given that we were all under lockdown, there was no way of ever finding out. So this is there's a big part of exclusion there um, which we should not forget. But ultimately speaking, this crisis has had different effects in different countries. Um, I want to first say a couple of words about Myanmar, and then I'll say a couple of words about Pakistan and refer back to the question which came from Nepal. So actually, I spoke to a colleague of mine in Myanmar, this was before the coup, about this paper that Kusha and I were writing and how 
we felt that there had been quite a lot of inequalities that had been created um, and uh, the exclusion through uh, the fact that people had to navigate in the di digital world. And she said, actually, our experience has been quite different. And she was very specifically talking about a project on teacher training, actually training teacher educators at teacher education colleges and then helping them continue teacher training because actually this particular project had moved everything onto mobile phones. And in Myanmar, you could access uh, SIM cards very cheaply and mobile phones, um, smartphones, extremely cheaply, Chinese smartphones, extremely cheaply. Um, everything with a caveat that everything has changed on the 1st of February with the coup. And we were going to actually, she said, actually, this has meant that teacher trainees who are in the most remote areas would actually have access to the training that they might not have had access had they had to come to the colleges. So there are aspects which would have been interesting to explore um, had this been possible. But obviously then um, the coup happened on the 1st of February and all of that's obviously now off the table. Um, the thing I want to say about Pakistan, reflect Nepal, is that I work with an organization called the Citizens Foundation. And um, when COVID struck, so they are all over Pakistan, but their headquarters are in Karachi. They um, had the same kind of meetings, everyone else going like, what do we do now? And one of the things they did is they decided to put um, primary school classes on TV. So none of these teachers had ever been on TV or ever been recorded. But they basically, the agreement was that most villages will have TV and access to the local Pakistani channels, even if we're not talking here about satellite TV. And uh, again, it would be very interesting to do a study and to see actually how many of those children who were not able to access schools were able to access their school day on TV and how that actually worked. So local solutions, this is what I want to say about Nepal, depending on what people are able to access. So perhaps smartphones are too expensive and um, SIM cards are not accessible, but in certain cases, if they are, then moving things onto smartphones might be a local solution. Moving things onto TV might be a solution. In fact, it might also be a great idea to actually have a what worked and why during COVID, because COVID's not going to be the last crisis that the world faces. And having these kind of practical ideas with very clear instructions from teachers about what they felt worked rather than what the Delhi government did and the Indian government did, which was to put lots of stuff online that no one actually really had the energy to engage with and um, focusing rather on the local solutions um, and that we can all learn from. So, I mean, I think it uh, remains to be seen which of these di digital practices will remain um, post COVID and how they'll affect researchers and education practitioners. Um, but I think we do need to document the lessons learned for the next crisis. And in that, the most important thing is to listen to the local voices, in particular, the practitioners and the teachers on the ground. And I'll close with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Marie Law and Dr. Kushanan. That was uh, really helpful and also addressed many of the points that we've been seeing in the chat. So this um, concern with the inequalities that uh, COVID has, um, um, has increased in the country and also uh, on the ICT challenges that many countries face critically. So uh, maybe I'll go through some. We have received a lot of interesting comments and questions in the chat. And one of them came from Tarima Hossein, Bangladesh, who says, one of my findings from research during COVID in India and Bangladesh is digital division among teachers. Generally, it is assumed that only students are falling behind because of access and competency in digital platforms. It's true for teachers as well. So if you would like to comment on that briefly. Well, that's, um, I'll ask Kosha if she wants to add anything. But that's exactly what I said um, when I mentioned the fact that our research only access teachers who are able to access the online survey. So um, until someone's actually able to go into schools and to speak to teachers and say, what, what side of this divide did you fall on? What was your experience? And that's something which is only, oh, well, we thought it would be possible as of the summer, but clearly it's not as India goes through its second wave of COVID um, and everything is going to be shut down again. 
Um, but actually what would be important is to actually go and speak to teachers who did not make the jump into the digital space. Kusha, do you want to add? Um, I think you've summarized everything what I would say, but thank you, Darima, for the question. Okay, thank you both. Um, so maybe I would like to invite Mr. Doshu from Bhutan to share some reflections uh, with us on the challenge he's been facing in his context. Doshu, can you hear okay. it? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I've got a very uh, bad voice today. I was uh, sharing with uh, Joe's about the uh, experience in Bhutan that uh, some of my colleagues also shared in the account platform where uh, the impact of COVID on education. Uh, education, I mean, we had everyone uh, as a national effort has uh, put a lot of effort in the last academic year, but the challenges still remain as I presented and a few minutes ago on the uh, issues of connectivity, ICT, and also the pedagogy perspective. I think the presentations here are not raising here that the contact teaching has the pedagogy advantage and then also the environment. Uh, children are separated from the emotional touch of the parents to a classroom setting, so they learn more through the peers. But uh, with the home setting, that doesn't uh, happen. And with the ICT and uh, connectivity issues, Children uh, from the lower economic background or the rural areas are more disadvantaged than the uh, children who are talking about smartphones or WhatsApp, but children, uh, parents with two to three children, they need to buy more phones. That is implicating them directly. And then uh, in addition to buying the food, uh, that, that perspective has not captured into the, uh, the presentations. I was thinking how the, countries around the region are grappling with such issues. Well, Bangladesh case is uh, very, very uh, present earlier, was very insightful for us also. But we are thinking going forward, what do we do with the lockdown? We are saying, we are talking a lot of uninterrupted education, continuity of education, new normals, but lockdown is more real than any of those things. So. Uh, the challenges for education policy makers or implementers is how do we uh, channel resources or how do we channel the professionals to reach the, uh, to reach the last, last mile, particularly in most cases, education battle before COVID is uh, about the last mile, reaching the last mile. Girls education, disability, inclusion, uh, poverty, children from the low income families. So now with the COVID, uh, looking forward, there's, uh, I think it's a resetting the whole economy of education. So there's an advantage from, from our side that the focus now is on education, education. Now, I think it gives the policy forum, uh, policy makers here, and then also the senior uh, researchers like professors. I think this gives a new flow for them to uh, point out a new opportunity for education that this is the way forward now. Uh, Working from the economic side, paving a road or building bridges will not bring uh, lighten up the future unless we invest into education and then enlighten the hearts and souls that this is the new way of doing things and we have to build the acceptance to that one. So I'll just I'll end here, given the very limited time of the very expertise here. I'm, if I take more floor, I'll be more greedy. So thank you very much for giving the floor. Many thanks, Mr. Doshu. So, uh, Professor Mahila, Dr. Kusha, would like to share some reflections, um, maybe on the opportunities that COVID-19 is bringing as well in the context you've been studying. Um, I think the opportunities from our research would be to listen to teachers' voices. And I think we've been, I've, I've got my PhD on teachers' voices as well. And there was no actually background research on teachers' voices when I started my PhD. So I feel that teachers' voices needs to be heard and I've been, uh, I've, we've highlighted in the presentation as well that why those voices needs to be heard as well. What needs to be changed? There is everything available to, to these teachers, resources, tools, 
uh, books, applications, training. I mean, the Dairy Education Revolution has given a lot of training to these teachers before they put into the lockdown. But what we didn't uh, find out of researches on teachers' voices, what exactly they are facing, what the issues they are facing. I do like the suggestion of uh, bringing the outdoor outdoor spaces to uh, into the digital spaces. Some of our responders are using it. For example, they have started using some of the ingredients in the kitchen or they've started taking their videos in the garden. One of our teachers has doing theater. Uh, he's, uh, he's actually practicing his theatrical skills and converting it into the digital video and passing it on to her students' WhatsApp group. So, uh, so for, for me, the opportunity is to listen to teachers' voices and work on some of the better practices for the policymakers. Professor Lam. Yeah, just to say that um, we did mention briefly that teachers all agreed that the digital space can't replace um, the um, real classroom. I mean, that was said and we, we actually reflected that in the presentation. But ultimately speaking, rather than um, delving on and, and focusing on uh, what, you know, the fact that this can't be replaced, there was no choice. Right, teachers just had to get on with it. The fact is that that doesn't mean that we want to replace the real classroom with a digital way, but let's try and use the lessons learned, what the teachers have told us, what worked, what didn't work, in order to A, prepare for the next crisis where you know it might not be a pandemic, it might be an earthquake, it might be a flood, we don't know, where teachers do have to revert back to teaching from home and from their kitchen table. Um, let's learn from that and support other teachers who were not able to come up with these ideas or who were not able to access those resources, support those to be able to do that when this strikes the next time. In the meantime, let's all get back into the classroom and we really definitely want to do our project and look, look at teaching practice in the classroom. Okay, many thanks. Um, so maybe just uh, one last question before we move to our next presentation. Um, so we received a comment from Purna Kumar Shreta, who says, I think we need to play the collaborative ways they are engaging with children, not only focusing on learning, but it's important that extracurricular activities such as dance, singing, storytelling are important for children's well-being as well in this context. Would you like to comment on that? Could we do another project, Professor Lal, on parents <laughs> and uh, students' voices? But we, in, when we were collecting the data in the online space, we did position teachers as parents as well. And when after the interview, they were reflecting on their own efficacy as parent to engage with some of the learning and how they're actually juggling with so many responsibilities as a parent, as a teacher, but also as a um, as a, as a, a daughter-in-law in the house. So we got some reflections on that, but I think it's another project, Professor Lau. But I also think what's important to note is that teachers did say to us in their follow-on project when we were doing the long Zoom calls about their practice and so on, um, that they actually went to their children and younger people to learn more about the digital space and how they were supported. In fact, a lot of my university colleagues um, I mean, I don't have children, but the fact is a lot of my university colleagues went to their kids to be able to improve their Zoom lectures, um, improve the way that they were using WhatsApp or Telegram or any of these other spaces. Um, I had to rely on some of my students to help me with this, including you, Kusha. Uh, and that's also teachers, some of the children also helped arranging this online research for us. When we were conducting online research, we saw some kids like, you know, connecting uh, um, Zoom or another application for us to have this interaction with teachers. So uh, they were playing a lot in um, providing that digital literacy to their parents or teachers. Many thanks for the great presentation and reflections, Professor Marhila and Dr. Kushanand. Um, so like, to suggest now that we give the floor to Pravin Dahan Balak Balakshan, sorry if I didn't pronounce it correctly, uh, who will talk to us a little bit about the pandemic shock on an education system and act on a theory perspective. All right. Thank you, Marina. Okay, uh, I've just shared my screen. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, all right. So I'm just going to start. I'm just going to jump in. 
Okay. All right. So, um, so today I'll be talking about how the pandemic has shocked uh, the Malaysian education system. And I'm using the actor network theory here to inform my observations. Uh, so these are just like my observations. And I use a little bit of ANT to try to understand um, what's happening. Okay. So this is the map of Malaysia. It's right in the Southeast Asia. Uh, it's summer all year. Uh, so as you can see, when the pandemic uh, came in, uh, when the pandemic struck, uh, all these networks was disrupted. Okay, all the networks uh, was disrupted. Schools were closed, and Malaysia is a country um, which uh, which has a very uh, which has a very highly centralized education system. Uh, it's very top down. So when the pandemic came, it was a it gave a lot of shock uh, to the uh, to the Ministry of Education. But before we start, I'm just going to make some informed assumptions what most, nedu what most uh, national education systems are. Uh, I mean, all of this can be contested, uh, but I definitely feel some of these uh, resonate with Malaysia the most. Okay, so first thing, we know education systems are static and they are stable. Um, they are slow to change uh, to any kind of disruption. And we all of us know that uh, education systems uh, education systems are made of both human and non-human actors and in Malaysia particular uh, in Malaysia especially uh, standardized national assessments continue to play a big role in in determining one's destiny like um, if you score well in the national assessment you can access scholarships uh, it, it determines your future um, it determines your future academic pathway and ultimately your career trajectory so uh, standardized national assessments or high stakes exams play a big role in Malaysia, in, in, in the Malaysian education system. Um, I'm not sure how it is, uh, how it is in other countries, uh, but I, I'm pretty sure in most uh, Asian countries, exams, um, the, the, the education system is geared towards exams. And learning loss uh, has always been happening. Like even before the pandemic, there, there was already learning loss. And the whole framing of learning loss after the pandemic um, personally, for me, was tied to productivity, accountability, and also very much tied to the economy. Um, but learning loss itself was uh, already happening even before the pandemic. So, as I apply ANT, um, I noticed four configurations. Um, so, the first one was the public trust on standardized uh, assessments. So, uh, what I noticed was um, the public, as especially the Malaysian public, uh, they were we are, we are we are very inclined to exams but when the pandemic came uh it was the first time i noticed that there were teachers students and even parents calling for exams to be cancelled and i found that extremely surprising now i'm a teacher in in, in malaysia i teach in I, I teach in a public school and for me it was shocking because exams have always played a big role and suddenly they were uh actors uh saying that you know what it's time that we, we, we end exams. So that for me was surprising. And then this leads to the second, uh, to the second configuration, which is the use of uh, data-driven insight. Uh, now, this is not exactly happening in Malaysia right now, um, explicitly, uh, but it is, uh, I feel that uh, it's about time. It will happen soon uh, when we start using uh, data-driven insights to inform education uh, progress of our students. And then I noticed uh, emergence of new forms of public-private partnership in education. Um, as we know, national education systems are a little bit slow in responding, and they do not have the resources to mobilize education. So the pandemic was a good opportunity for um, international organizations or even local actors to form partnerships with the ministry itself. Uh, and that was something which was happening. Um, and then finally, the changing role of the human teacher. I think this very much ties back to what Professor Marie Lal and Dr. Kusha were talking about earlier, the teacher agency. So this is the four configurations which I noticed. Now, so, okay, coming back now. So the first one, uh, so we all know COVID-19, put a pause on learning, exams were canceled or delayed. Okay, this is what happened. Um, so I think in the UK, algorithms were first used to determine the final scores. Um, and there was this issue where there was a significant reduction of final grades and the students were, that, that were most affected that was most affected were poorest and vulnerable students and 
I think uh, Malaysia kind of understood this and they didn't want to go to, to that path to use algorithms or even to use um, exams previous tests as the, as the indicator for the final result. So we, we postponed our exam, which was supposed to be in November 2020. It was postponed to February 2021. Um, so this again clearly shows to me like, like standardized national assessments continue to play a role. And it's, um, and, and it's, it's impossible to, to, for, for Malaysia especially to cancel this big exam because it determines a lot, especially, especially for the students. And I think it was a similar case for Vietnam where the pandemic was ongoing, but the cases were, were a bit low and the Ministry of Education carried out the exams as well. Uh, and I think the implications of the, this was, you know, there was stress on all the actors. There were students, teachers and parents. Um, they were all saying that this standardized, standardized national assessments uh, in Malaysia, we call it SPM. Uh, they say that, you know, it's outdated, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's just unjust and it's time we abolish these exams. Uh, and I found that as a teacher myself, you know, as a teacher, and I teach this, these final year students, um, as a teacher, when I go to the classroom, there are days, I mean, like most of the times I teach to the test. And I think that's how it is because I don't want my students to be, um, I want my students to do well in the exams. And, and I found that extremely surprising when the students themselves coming out and saying it's time we abolish this and parents supporting that and there was calls for alternative assessments. So these are some of the headlines like there was like one headline stated that over 40,000 uh, students seek to stop SPM exam so SPM was the high stakes exam that I was talking about and then there was parents who are concerned over these exams. Uh, so this was something new and if there was no pandemic, uh, this would not this would not happen. So that was uh, that was one fascinating configuration for me. And um, the second one, the use of data-driven insights in the form of learning analytics. Um, so what happened was, uh, so Williamson and Hogan, they wrote this amazing book. It was published last year, 2020. Um, and I think this is what I, what's happening. I feel as a teacher, uh, many of these uh, global ed tech corporations or even like, um, uh, even like international organizations, they use the pandemic as an uh, opportunity to push their own agendas, their own educational transformation. They establish it as a, as a crisis. Uh, it is a crisis, uh, but the way they play onto it uh, is, is amazing to see. Uh, and one of these amazing tools which I came across um, uh, is, the, is the use of emotion recognition, artificial intelligence tools in schools. Uh, this is in Hong Kong actually, so not in Malaysia, but this is in Hong Kong. Uh, there's this uh, software called Four Little Trees and it can, it can measure students' uh, emotions, um, muscle points on the student's face, and then identify the emotions. So it looks pretty cool, but it's also pretty scary because then you, as a student, you need to police your thoughts, you need to your emotions while being in the class. So I think that was, uh, for me, it's like, wow, I, 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 never, I, I never was such kind of tools. But so how is this connected to, Mal to Malaysia or even beyond? So I think um, there are early adopters and late adopters of this kind of tech. Now, if, if you are the one, if you are the country that you are you're spearheading this tech, now you get to spearhead the innovation and you get to legitimize it, right? And then you can show how it is effective. And then what happens is this tech or whatever, uh, whatever technology that is produced, it percolates to late adopters. In this case, maybe Malaysia, right? And as a late adapter, you have no choice and you risk being shamed by the public, your own, your own citizens, or for, for being left behind if you don't adapt this kind of technologies uh, in your classroom in the future. Um, so I'm just trying to draw one comparison here. I think we can also draw this back. If you look back at uh, OECD's PISA, uh, so when PISA first came in, like let's take Malaysia for example. Uh, Malaysia started participating in PISA in 2009, if I'm not mistaken. But if today Malaysia says, look, we do not want to participate in PISA, we, wanna, we, we don't want to do anything with this, we feel it's unreliable. And if we say that, now we risk being shamed uh, by our own people, by their own citizens, and also our neighboring countries, that our education system has no quality. And it's the same thing for this kind of for this kind of global tech uh, or, or, or uh, global tech corporations. Uh, since they are the one uh, spearheading this innovation, they get to decide uh, 
they get to decide um, the, the 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 product. They get to decide what it is. And as a late adapter, we do not have the choice. We would just accept this kind of tech, and that can be structure. So, okay, moving on. This is the third configuration which I noticed. There was the the there was an emergence of new forms of public-private partnerships. So. Uh, Williamson, Williamson and Hogan, uh, they write that Google and Microsoft, they are in a chase of structural domination um, of, of, of providing uh, education infrastructure in this, in this situation. So now PPP in Malaysia uh, has uh, shifted a lot and the, and the state is now more receptive for partnership uh, with uh, local actors and also international actors. So in March 2020, in our first lockdown, the first thing the government did was it partnered with Google for Education, uh, Google for Education, and they provided online webinars to upskill teachers for online learning. And this was um, this was something which was already in the pipeline, but um, the pandemic accelerated it. And three months after that, in June 2020, the Ministry of Education, which was using Google. Um, which was using uh, Google Education uh, for its online learning, uh, partnered then with, the, with Microsoft, uh, Google, and Apple to come up with its own system called Delima. Uh, I think it's called Digital Educational Learning Initi Initiative Malaysia. So PPP itself is like, um, is changing. Uh, PPP itself in Malaysia is changing as now local actors, they get to have, uh, uh, they get to play, uh, no, sorry, they get to work with the ministry uh, uh, and provide solutions. So there's a, there's a couple of solutions which I did not put here. Uh, one of it was uh, the ministry partnered with a television network to provide uh, uh, to provide classes uh, classes through uh, through television. And I think most countries are doing that today. I know Pakistan is doing that. I know Indonesia is doing that. Uh, and it also partnered with a, with another foundation, uh, a local foundation to provide mobile phones for students to carry out online learning. So uh, PPP is uh, shifting much uh, with the pandemic and the pandemic has accelerated different kinds of partnership, different kinds of uh, realignments. And it's interesting to see, uh, it's also interesting to see how all of this flourish um, to get an idea what's happening uh, with the education system. Okay, now the final configuration, which I noticed was, um, the changing role of the human teacher. And now uh, I'm a teacher and I was affected by the pandemic. Like I, I went to schools, uh, I, I went back to school in January, 2020. I did my master's and I went back to school in January, 2020. I was barely getting to know my students. And then in March, there was the first lockdown which lasted up until um, August, August, I believe. Um, and it totally transformed uh, the, 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 as me as a teacher, it transformed me like from being in a physical classroom with my students. Uh, now I'm in an online uh, forum with them. And, and online here, yeah, it, can, it's, it's can, it can be defined uh, in many ways. Uh, it can be defined in the use of web-based platforms, social media applications or video conferencing tools, uh, maybe more than that. Um, and now as a human teacher, so in the classroom, I've done this little bit of, um, uh, what do you call it? Illustration, graphic. I don't know what it is. Okay. So, uh, so what happens is now being in the classroom where I can interact with my students, uh, for uh, where learning happens. Now the interaction is is out of it, right? Like if you look at the uh, the image below, like I am now in my own physical state, in my own physical place, and my student is in a different physical place, and the circle. It becomes the place where we interact. So for me to carry out learning, I need to understand the different platforms and how it is used. Like, like I can't use Microsoft Teams with my school with my students. They don't use that. So I need to, and I can't use Zoom with my students as well. But they know how to use Google Meet, and that would work, right? And then not all of my students uh, use. Not all my students would want to be in the in, in want to be in the class to me online because they don't have the data for it. So what do I do? I can use Instagram. I can post images of the lessons. I can use TikTok, make bite-sized videos. They can watch that. 
So as a teacher now, is this not know, is this not about knowing the pedagogy? It's not just knowing about that, but it's also knowing what the different platforms caters for different kind of learning. Like, for example, if I were to use Facebook, is it best for forums? Is it best for students to discuss stuff? But the same thing I can't do for with Kahoot because Kahoot is smooth to quiz. So it's the interaction for the for, for meaningful learning to take place. Both the teacher and both the students must be aware of these different platforms. And and the fifth point is the public gaze now turns to the teacher. I think this goes back to the teaching uh, to the teacher agency that Dr. Kusha and Prof, uh, Professor Lal were talking about. Like I'm in my house, I'm conducting my lessons. I have my wife looking at me like, oh, what are you teaching today? Because she's a teacher herself. And she's like, oh, this is how you teach summary? OK, all right, cool. Maybe I'll take some parts of you. So it's the, it's the, everything has changed. And that's OK, right? This is my wife looking at me. And I'm cool with that. But now I put in, I, I, will, I, I do videos and I send to my students. Now their parents get to watch what I teach, right? And that, for me, is tough because then they're going to judge me. Like, is this your English teacher? Is this how you pronounce a certain word? What's, what's wrong with the English teacher? That is tough. Like if I were to ask uh, 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 this, this awesome doctor to, per to perform an open heart surgery in front of the public, would he do that? I don't think so. He'll be like, no, man, I, I can't do that. I can't do an open heart surgery with everyone looking at me. But now we teachers, we have no choice. I have to do that and people are going to judge me and that sucks. But so the public gaze has totally changed, right? They now can see what I'm doing in the classroom. So that's a little bit tough. And so what are the key takeaways? So I've came up with some key, ta key takeaways here and some questions as well. So the first thing, again, public trust and standard uh, assessment has greatly, has greatly reduced. But is this, is this just temporary? And if we are going to propose alternative assessments, uh, what will they be? What kind of assessments are we going to promote? So that's one thing that we should consider. And we know learning analytics is going to come to the picture and learning analytics, all of us are going to use it. I know universities already use it. Soon will be in schools. But who owns the data? Will the state own the data? And if the, even if the state owns the data, how will they use the data? I think these are all ethical questions that we need to ask. And as a teacher myself, the state is going to own whatever stuff that I produce and what the state can do with that kind of, uh, with, with what kind of learning materials I produce, right? And there's this new form of PPP which is happening. So before this, if we looked at international organizations, uh, World Bank, OECD, for example, um, they try they, they intervened at a policy level. But with the pandemic, they are also able to intervene at a pedagogy level, right? I mean, TISA, for example, says you need to teach a certain kind of way of reading and certain kind of way of science and math questioning and all that. So with the pandemic, it acce it accelerates this. So now international organizations can intervene at policy and both pedagogy level because they are the ones who are provi providing the infrastructure. And finally, um, okay, human actors and non-human actors, we've got to work together to create meaningful learning, right? But then what happens then? Uh, so these are the questions that, um, that I think that we should ask ourselves. And these are the key takeaways. I hope you guys enjoyed the presentation. I think, yeah, I'm done. So I'm open for questions. Many thanks, Pravin. That was really, really helpful uh, in understanding many of the points as well that have been raised uh, um, during the presentations in the chat. Uh, and I suggest uh, we address some of these questions that were also sent earlier, uh, but maybe one that just came in from Fabiana Malio uh, from Denmark, who says, how can we ensure participants' iterative consent and negotiate reciprocal and tangible benefits in the COVID-19 education research process? Uh, so the question is, uh, what is the question again? Sorry, I didn't get it. Yeah, so maybe, maybe we can focus on how can we uh, get the consent uh, during this COVID-19 education research process and also how to negotiate reciprocal and tang tangible benefits uh, for all parts during the COVID-19 education research process. Okay. Uh, does someone have a, has a response for that? Yeah, if any of the presenters, please feel free to um, jump in. If you'd like Marina, to. Should, I, should I take it? Because I, I've been thinking about that since Fabiana wrote it in, 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 the, um, in the chat. I, I think it's very interesting because research ethics frameworks 
um, have been elaborated and um, become an important process, partly of gatekeeping, gatekeeping, partly of ensuring quality, and partly of standardizing education research. And I think the, 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 the two examples of, of studies uh, we've heard um, from Marie and, um, and Kusha and from Praveen, um, I'm sure Marie, Marie and, and Kusha's study had, uh, had UCL ethics uh, um, stamp of approval on it. But what Praveen's research is, is a form of uh, reflective practice. He's reflecting on himself and his, his location um, as a practitioner and a, a critical interlocutor of, the, of what's happening in Malaysia and what's happening in the countries around about him. He doesn't have to give himself ethical clearance to engage in this reflection. And I, 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 I think the, um, uh, that uh, what Fabiana's raising is both the need for ethics reviews to be alert to these, this kind of decentering of, ed, uh, of education research, while also um, protecting and being concerned with, with vulnerability, being concerned with uh, protection, being concerned with confidentiality. So again, I, I can't say how to do it, but um, I, I can say why to do it is to be so alert to the context and to be so open to things changing because not to say that there's just one standard ethics format that's always going to work because things so much is changing and um, for, I guess for us who are involved in editing journals or special issues to be open to the this kind of reflective practice that uh, the, this kind of almost new genre of, um, of of education research is exemplified by what Praveen uh, has presented here uh, the, the engaged practitioner who's pushing us theoretically. They're not just um, uh, um, skill, skillful practitioners. They're asking big questions and asking them in a very um, uh, alert and interesting way. So again, it's, it, it's not an answer, but an expansion of the question, which I hope is helpful. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Professor Elaine. Um, so maybe we have time for just one uh, last question, if you can stay with us for just a few more minutes. Um, so this question came earlier from Ellen Hill, who talks about the Timor-Less uh, context. And she says, using radio and television for a class in Timor-Less has made the general public, especially parents, realize what is taught in school, often for the first time which has led to a bit of debate, which didn't, which didn't take place before. No Praveen or others, would you like to comment on that, on this uh, um, new role of families and uh, the debate that this is uh, raising and the, the um, let's say, the increased awareness on the, on the right. importance of education as well. Yeah, okay. I'll, just, I'll just make a short comment on that. Uh, so, um, so with my students, I, I asked them, uh, so, have you guys been watching television? Uh, have, you, have you guys been watching the the the, uh, the academic programs going on in school, uh, going on in the television? Because we also had that, uh, and my students bluntly told me, "No, we don't do that. We we, don't, we, we didn't watch them." So, I, I I'm not sure how beneficial uh, those stuffs are. Uh, how beneficial these television shows are? I can't comment directly uh, because I feel like like my students. I'm talking from my perspective. My students do not watch them. They feel like it's a little bit of waste of time, but but one thing that can be done is the teacher connects the student with the with whatever shows or, or or radio programs that is going on. That means the teacher uses maybe WhatsApp to send a notification and say, okay, um, why don't you got uh, why don't uh, all of you watch uh, this uh, show which is happening today at 8 p.m. and then maybe uh, uh, get them to draw some conclusions, some reflections from that. And maybe then they can engage. Uh, uh, Marina, sorry, but there's one question in the chat box which I really want to answer. 
Uh, is this, is this, is this, it will only take me like two minutes. Okay. Uh, so the, the question PPP is what, one. Yeah, it's about PPP. So do you yeah. feel like, so uh, thanks to Darshini for the question. Do you feel like there might be groups that might be excluded as a result of these partnerships? I definitely feel PPP is beneficial to some point, but yes, it excludes the people with the most little voice in your society. I feel that's what's going to happen because those people who are engaging, those the people who are running these uh, private uh, private entities, um, they are the central, right? They are they are the they are the urban central English speaking, uh, modernized ones, not the rural folks, not the ones on the peripheries. So. I think the ones that will be most affected or excluded are the ones that do not have voice. And I think as policymakers or teachers, I think we need to make their voices to be heard. Comes back to what Dr. Kusha said, we need to hear what that we need to hear teachers' voices because teachers are always in the peripheries when it comes to education policy making. And I guess this closes perfectly um, our QA. So I'd like to thank, thank everyone and give the floor um, to Jose Luis Canelias, our Kix CAP Hub Manager, for his okay. closing remarks. Thank you, Marina. And um, our first words can go to the speakers today. So you managed to um, create here a very lively discussion. It was a learning exchange um, session. So thank you, Professor Elena Terhalter, Professor Marilal, Dr. Kusha, Anan, and Pravim. Uh, you managed here to raise some of the challenges, make us more aware of some of the challenges, the inequalities, the missing of the classroom interaction. I saw, I saw some positive messages on this, but also remembering us that COVID also brought some opportunities. Um, the increasing role of families, the focus, the families now focusing more on the education processes, on the being more attention to what students are learning, but also the issues on innovation, and the role, increased role of youth and the, the importance that youth has been given to education. Um, there was some also some important points on the difference between schooling and education and the role of activities such as dancing, singing, and storytelling play within all the education um, process. Uh, a lot of questions are left unanswered. There are expansion of existing questions, and this will continue. And there are still uh, big question marks whether some of the issues that were raised here will persist past uh, COVID-19. So we will learn more, much more about this topic in the next NORAG special issue. Link to this and other relevant NORAG resources will be shared with you all by email. Our eighth webinar is a step for, forward in our KCP initiative that is made possible by the Global Partnership for Education and the International Development Research Center from Canada. Our hub is all about making knowledge useful for national education systems in our 21 countries. So we are supporting bridges between knowledge producers and knowledge users, between global and national expertise, and between policy research and practice. And our goal is always to make contributions, small, humble contributions to national education systems. In this, our next knowledge activities, we will have a next webinar in the end of May on the topic of using evidence in education planning and management. UNESCO IP will partner with us and will give us an outlook on the different meanings of the word evidence. Other activities we, we are going to have shortly are the Kick CEP podcast. We launched the first Kick CEP podcast with education leaders from our region. Uh, on the 7th of April. This is available in our websites. And the second uh, Kicks AP uh, podcast will be launched on the first Wednesday of the month on next, uh, the, the 5th of May. There is an open call for abstracts for our regional conference that will be in October on education policy and innovation. And we are starting mobilization of participants for the learning cycles, which are one month's professional development opportunities for national experts in our hub countries. Uh, and we'll have two learning cycles, one partnering with UNESCO IIP on equitable access to education, and then what, another one partnering with the Australian Council for Education Research on the integration of 21st century skills in curriculum. So this is some of our next activities. Our recordings for today will be made publicly available. We also want to know how we can do better 
what we do, but how we do. So please fill out our evaluation survey that we shared in the chat and will be shared by you by email. Subscribe to our updates so that you can be uh, receive firsthand all of our links to our work and our content. And um, our journey does not stop today. It, it is just starting. Thank you very much for your participation.